right. Okay. Okay, guys, it says we are live. Welcome to Caliber Corner, episode number 131. And tonight we're going to talk about the basics of reloading shot shells. I want to apologize for some reason. There's an incorrect date uh, saying that the episode was for 411. It's not for 411. It's for 413, which is today our usual time. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot of information we want to cover for you. we got a few new people on the panel and a few people that won't be able to make it this evening. Uh, before we do anything, let's go ahead and let the panel introduce themselves, and after that, we'll see who's watching tonight, and then we'll go ahead and fire it up. So, again, reloading is one of those things that's really taken off right now, whether it's new people that are getting into firing for the first time, or those of us that just don't feel like going out, we'd rather roll our own. We got that option. So, let's go ahead and start off with uh, Rich White. Rich, what is new in your world, man? How's it going? Not too bad. We had an epic uh, show last night with a candy Easter candy bracket where... We got some back and forth over what's the best Easter candy. The show is called um, This Week Unloaded. And, Rich, what time is that show on, by the way? That is Sunday evening with a start time between 8 and 9 p.m. Eastern. Right on, right on. Yeah, we had an epic candy bracket. I even had to argue with science and statistics. I really had to do a lot of research to defend the Cadbury um, um, caramel egg last night. So. I don't know. I don't know. It seems like there was a lot of hurt feelings. A lot of people that just had to duck out. There's a lot of arguing that happened. We take our sugar very, very passionately in this old age. So, all right. All right. So, Rich, I appreciate you being here, man. You've been on the show a lot. It's always great to have you stop by. And you guys make sure you check out Rich. All right. Okay. Um, Alaskan Ballistics is in the house. How's it going, dude? Very well. Thanks for letting me uh, join in. I'm here to learn about some shock shell reloading and I've done tons of rifle and pistol, but never shot shell very much. So, Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, we, we focus, focus a little bit on the uh, pistol side of it and basic reloading last week, and today we're going to do shotguns. Maybe next week we'll do some rifles. So Alaska Ballistics, you got a channel you want people to check out on YouTube or what? Yes, I do. Uh, I do a, a, a live chat every Monday night uh, starting at 7 Alaskan time, which is like 11 Eastern time and everything okay. in between. And then I do... Uh, a ballistics testing video uh, every every week on Wednesdays. I put out a ballistics testing video of some kind, shoot over chronograph, and then do a redneck science project with it. So, <laughs> so, so it's one of those how many how many phone books can you uh, shoot in a situation, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, usually it's like water jugs and watermelons and stuff like that. Yeah. Pork, pork ribs yeah. and pork shoulders and cloth and stuff like that. So, right on, man. Cool, cool. All right, and uh, also joining us, uh, let's see here. Oh, looks like, see, John may have to jump back in here. We've got uh, Avid Waterfowler was with us a second ago. He'll he'll come back in for a second. AWAG's in the house. AWAG, what you been up to, man? How you doing? Howdy. I've been uh, bitten by the long-range precision bug again. Mm -hmm. um, I have spent way too much money on this so far, um, and I ended up... Uh, snagging a surgeon uh, action, short action that I'm going to build off a uh, 6.5 by 47 Lapua. Um, don't ask me how much I paid for that action because it'll make some of you kind of cry. Wait, what kind of action is that? Sorry, I got kicked out there for a second. It's a surgeon. Surgeon oh, action. Geez. All right, so, man. Okay. Good stuff in the, in the, in the line. Yeah, I want that cartridge so bad. I'm just messing around with the cheaper version, 6.5 Creed. All I need is a barrel, a stock, trigger, and um, a couple <laughs> and a other little things here. Some optics, Madden. some ammo, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I got the, I got the, the, the uh, optics all situated, but everything else I need. Yeah. All right, man. Cool, cool. Waywag, I'm glad you're here. You've been with us for a long time now, and... Uh, Reloading is one of those things where you got some knowledge, so we're going to see if we can add to that a little bit, all right? All right. Thanks for having cool, me. Cool. All right. Also joining us, we got a little Missouri Patriot. Missouri, what do you know, man? How's it going? All pretty good. How are you guys? We're doing good. So are you a, a, a shotgun reloader guy? You shot shell reloader or not? No, I'm not a reloader at all. I'm just here to okay. learn something. Cool. Remember, you guys ask questions if you got them. Um, over in the chat, you guys ask questions. If we miss it, put the question up there again, and we'll try to catch it, okay? All okay. right. And also joining us for the first time ever, we've got a little Storm and Norman going on. Storm and Norman, how you doing, man? What's going on? I'm good. What's up? All right. Not much, man. Uh, you got a channel on YouTube you want people to check out? I've seen some of your videos over on GunTube.org. Do you have a YouTube channel? 
Okay, okay, that's right. You guys check out uh, Storm and Norman Gunworks channel over there on GunTube.org. You're gonna like it. Uh, good stuff. So he's just getting started. All right, man. I'm glad you can be with us tonight, and uh, it's good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Appreciate cool, it. Cool, cool. If you got questions you. on reloading shot shells, man, we've got an expert with us tonight. So, And uh, front and center right here uh, on, on my grid, at least, we've got Avid Waterfowler, a.k.a. John. So, so, so John, how you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty good, guys. Just got done being an essential employee for the day, so... There I'm you just go. happy everything's panning out for me so far. <laughs> well, you're going to be an essential instructor for this evening because a lot of us <laughs> don't know much about reloading shot chills, and uh, a lot of people don't. And, you know, the reason why they say they don't is because, you know, well, you don't save any money on it, but there's actually – it actually goes way beyond that. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Real quick, let's see who's uh, watching this evening. So we've got a little Calaveras 32 special out there. Calaveras, how's that Reese's egg going, buddy? Uh, New York Outcast is watching tonight. Daniel Pfeiffer's out there. Gun-loving Grandpa's out there, too. Patrick Pew Pew in the house. Justin Gibbons. New York Outcast. SS Pond. Going to listen while driving home. Sounds good, buddy. AWAG 1000. Gunpowder Beauty. Yoder Texas. Rolling Trip. Fluffy 10 millimeter Jeep guy. I like that. I'm fluffy. I like 10 millimeters and I love Jeeps. Sully Yacker, what's going on, buddy? How you doing, man? Welcome, welcome. Uh, let's see here. Southpaw RX, tacos and french fries always. Matthias is out there. Hola, Matthias. Says, Hola, amigo. Como estas? And let's see here. Scott P79 in the house. Weston Probst. And I think that's about it. So just a reminder that, oh, Tim Naden just joined in uh, over there on the chat too. So quick reminder that tonight's episode is sponsored by SS Pond in Lexington, Nebraska. I want you guys to give SS Pond a call. They are just off the interstate for uh, Lexington, Nebraska. Take that exit. Go north. It's on the right. Stop in there. Say hello to Stan and SS Pond will take care of your firearms needs. Whew, man, lots of stuff tonight. Okay, so, so, so John, you're center stage here, man. Um, oh, real quick, real quick. I'm getting a lot of comments on my reloading videos and a comment I keep responding to because I respond to a lot of comments over and over and over again. Oh, well, the cost of store ammo. Why would anybody reload? I can get it at such and such store. Well, a couple things I want to tell you real quick. Quick top five why I want you to consider reloading this year. All right. Even if you can't get all the components, even if you can't get powder yet or whatever, there's five reasons I want you to consider doing it. Number one, bug out, SHTF, grid down, no electricity. You can reload. If you've got a flashlight to load by, you've got a reloading manual, you can reload without electricity. You can use a balance scale. You can keep yourself supplied no matter how bad things get. We're going into storm season, as a lot of us are discovering, right? Um, things are a little unsteady right now, so you can do it without electricity. Number two, relaxation. It's a way to get away from everybody, everything, all the noise in the world. You can get out there and just chill. You focus on a little process. For some people, it's like a meditation. You're proud of yourself when you get done with it, right? Number three, you don't have to leave the house. For a lot of us that live in some of these rural areas, it's a long drive to go get shotgun ammunition. You might say, well, that's what the internet's for. Okay, well, if you want to pay internet shipping prices, you go right ahead. And things are a little bit thin on the internet right now in terms of ammo. Prices are going up. Uh, number four, custom loads. Okay, you might want to make yourself a three-inch 20-gauge round, right? That's a cheap one to go buy in the store if you can even find it. Custom loads, you can tailor it the way you want it. You can get the shots you want, the powder combination. You can make it work best for you, making a shell that's going to be superior to pre-made cheap ammo. And finally, there's the money savings aspect of it. Maybe not so much with certain calibers. And when it comes to shot shells, it depends on what you're loading. But, you know, a lot of your rifle rounds, a lot of your more expensive uh, handgun ammunition, it's way cheaper to load it at home than it is to buy it in the store, especially when it means going out when we're not supposed to and all that fun stuff. So with that being said, John, please introduce us into the world of shot shell reloading. What do we need to know? Where do we all begin? Right, guys. So all right. it, it's a whole lot to it. I guess one of the first things I'd like to talk about is the there's always this misconception of it's cheaper to go buy it instead of make your own. But the, the thing is, the really the, the truth is, is it's just not it's not created equal so for example you know when you go to cabela's or whatever and you're looking for 270 to hunt deer you can get remington core locks for what 20 bucks but you can buy a set of nosler custom ammunition for what 45 50 so it's really the same thing with shotgun shells it's really no different so if if somebody says that they're, they're just being a little naive or maybe they're trying to justify why they don't want to get into it the the truth of the matter is there is, there's a big difference. There's powders, there's primers, there's wads, there's hulls, and there's a lot that goes into a premium shell versus a bargain basement shell. And 
the beauty about reloading is you can, even if it were to say a break even point to the cheap bargain basement shell, you can go make a premium shell for probably at least, you know, 50 cents cheaper a box. You know, you're not going to save $3 a box. But here's the thing if you can go buy a, um, uh, a Remington STS, you know, you buy you buy a box of these, you're looking eight to ten bucks for twenty five. Well, what if you can buy the wads of shot powder primer and everything yourself and load them for four fifty? So that that's kind of there's a little bit there's a little bit more to it, I think, sometimes than guys give it credit for, you know. And then a, a, a cheaper box of shells like this, these these cheaper federals, yeah, these are the ones you're going to pay five fifty six bucks a box. They're fine shells. Are they as good? No, they're not. And if you're really looking for the best, like a lot of reloaders that, you know, are making tack driving ammunition, you're, you're probably going to want to make your own. And there's something satisfying about it, too. You know, it's it's more than just, for me, a, a necessity. It's kind of a hobby and, and everything of it. And, and like I said to you guys before the show uh, went live, I, I'm an opportunist, man. I'll buy shot from anybody. I'll buy wads if I can find it secondhand. It's all brand new stuff. I'll buy it and and pay fifty cents on the dollar. And now I'm now I am making a box of premium shells for three bucks. And okay, it, so the question for you happen. then: a lot of these products are sold out online. There's back yeah. orders on these products right now. You got presses that you're ordering that aren't going to show up until May or June. Everybody goes to Amazon first. You know, prices are going up on Amazon. Where does one even begin to look for this stuff if you can't buy it locally? I mean, just like in a, in a retail store, where do you go? So in a retail store, are you talking on, like online? Kind if of I thing? can't, let's just say I don't want to get it online. What are some of the places a person could go to acquire the shot or the powder or the wads if they if they sold out online or their local sporting goods store doesn't have it in stock? Where are some of the places people can look? Uh, C- Cabela's seems to have a lot of that stuff, at least near me. seems like a lot of you guys have Cabela's at least somewhat near you. Badass, okay. bro. I have noticed a slightly higher cost there. Now, wads seem to be fair. Powder's a little on the high side. Primers are fair. Um, shot is a little bit more there, but it's also not the worst I've seen. I usually pay for um, a bag of... This is the kind of your your standard your standard shot that you're going to see. It's called Eagle Shot. Uh, it'd be the most common brand you'll see. Uh, I usually get this for between thirty five and forty bucks a bag. Okay. Now, as I showed you guys before the show, I, I went on Facebook Classified, so I'm willing to give that information to all you guys. Hopefully, you can benefit from it the way I have. Found a guy selling nine bags of, of shot, and I offered him one seventy five, and he took it. So, so you can get the components for your loading on Facebook or Craigslist. There's oh, yeah. no there's no rules against that. A person's got to worry about well, getting booted off or anything or what? I'm sure there is rules, and people find creative ways to list things, such as coffee table for sale and maybe a Benelli <laughs> sitting on it. So you know, <laughs> yeah, you, you got to do what you got to do in, yeah. in an anti Second Amendment type of uh, atmosphere Environment. that we live in today. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, like I said, I've done a bunch of different stuff, and, and there's a lot of good resources like online. Now, I, this is called Ballistics Products. So, the the one thing I'll say about this company is they do sell a lot of products more than than any. You'll you'll never step in a store that sells as much stuff as them. They are huge in marketing, though. So you do got to get careful that you don't get too caught up in it. Before you know it, you're buying more stuff than you need to make a shot shell, and it's it's just not necessary. But they will have shot in in different materials like bismuth, tungsten, tungsten iron, um, lead, you know, you name it, they'll offer it, you know, nickel plated, copper plated. They have just options galore. All right. That would be a great resource. So here's the thing, man. 48 hours ago, I knew absolutely nothing about shot shell reloading. Okay. So I went to Shields. I bought the Lyman fifth edition shot shell reloading handbook. And I know, yes, you can get these resources online for free. It's 20 bucks, but if the internet's down or you don't have electricity or you just like a good old-fashioned book you can mark up and write up and not have to print off because, you know, mm-hmm. ink is cheap for printers, you know, you got that option. So I've got this book. What are some of the basics to, What are some of the basic tools of the trade that we need to know if we want to get into shot shell reloading? Where do we begin? I would say that, like, you know, if you're going to start from scratch, you're going to buy shot, you're going to buy primers, powder, wads, and you're going to have some once-fired hulls. So I've got a couple different, couple different kinds here. Here's a double A. These are one of my favorites. Uh, that's an STS. That's another good one. These both have the brass bases. They're not okay. steel. 
Here's another. That's a red one. Too. And then here's a cheaper version of Remington STS. It's called Clay and Fields. Now, this has a steel base. Um, there's a Federal, so that'll have a steel base. This will not have that soft, supple plastic that double A's or STS's have. Um, and then here's a browning version, which is built just like an STS. It's just like this Remington Clay and Field, but this too has a steel base. This is actually made by Winchester, but it's it's browning. I mean, it's the same company. They're both they're they're both owned by Fabrique Nationale. But um, long story short, so what you'll need to get started, guys. I mean, you know, the the basic is a. Uh, let me see if I got my press. I don't know if you guys can see that. You guys see that press? There you there? go. Yep, yep. Okay. So uh, is there a certain brand you could recommend if we're just going to get into it? What works ab well, or ab what? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so what I would first start out as is, you know, a lot of guys will recommend the Lee, and I think Lee makes an okay product. But one of the reasons I try to steer you guys away from it is it does not have set bottoming out type functions that you would have on, say, a uh, your Lee press for making nine millimeter. Um, they're they're more by feel. And, and so that's why I would not recommend that press. Yes, they're cheap. Yes, they were absolutely not. All that you buy a Mech, a Mech 600 Junior. That's what I'd recommend. And you'd have a darn good chance of finding one of them secondhand on eBay. You look right now, I guarantee you could probably get one shipped to your house for 100 bucks. And so you're going to spend 75 80 on a brand new Leaf. When 20 bucks more, you can go buy a Mech. And one of the other nice things about a mech is these things have been made kind of similar for the last 50, 60 years. Parts are available. If you have one of the older ones where it has more metal components and now they use nylon, you can <laughs> buy replacement components that will go on the old press and you're good to go. And they still make parts for all that. And that's, that's a really nice thing. And these things are built like tanks. I mean, you you... You'd, you'd really have to work to wear one out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you read the reviews on these things. And there's people who are saying that their dads are still using the same ones that they got in the 60s and 70s. So, uh, Absolutely. So, got a question for you real quick here. This is from Storm and Norman. He said um, he's got uh, shotgun shells that are all brass holes. Do you know anything about that? Winchester still has I, a lot I don't of, do any of those. holes. Okay. Yeah, those are the type. If you're using all brass, what I do know about them is they're not typically done on a press. They're typically done by hand, and everything. they have several levers, layers of base wads. They don't typically use a plastic shot cup, and okay. my understanding is they kind of glue that. They actually glue that last. They call it an overshot card, and they'll glue that in place. I mean, that's about the extent of, of what I know about the, the brass. Hall. Okay, and uh, back to the press over there. Kind of give us kind of a run-through of what we're looking at on the press itself. Like, you, you buy the 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 Mech 600 Junior. I'm looking at it on Amazon right now. They're asking $242 for the Mark V 12-gauge press. And, yep. uh, you know, I, and I saw that also in the local sporting goods store. So what are what are some of the main parts of this? What do we need to know? For I mean, so, I know we got the manual, and we can learn how to watch videos and stuff. But, what I'll do, yeah. Travis, is let me, let me yep. show you the first one. So now this is okay. an actual... Let me make sure I can, if I'm getting this thing yeah. in there, uh, do you, do you see this six, do you see that 600 there? Well, we see about a third I'm... of it right now and we kind of see the lower third of it at this okay, point. So, so yeah, yeah. So right here, um, this particular area, this actually sizes the whole, this sizes the, um, this portion right here, it sizes it in a sizing ring kind of like when you when you run your your uh, metallic cartridge through say like a nine millimeter and there's a basically a sizing ring and mm -hmm. a little carbide sizing ring this is really similar now the type that i use mostly right now is is this type i have a hard time judging the camera this is no, a collet. okay so when i when i go down do you guys see that collet squeezing yep so I actually prefer those. I prefer these more because they can actually do high brass and they do high brass better. And what it does is it actually just like it, it, it squeezes the shell. So instead of running it through a, a die and forcing this to kind of like kind of come in, mm -hmm. this actually squeezes it all from the side. Lee actually makes a die for, um, 
for like neck tension and everything where you actually squeeze a mandrel. And that's okay. kind of how this works, except obviously there's nothing in the center. So this press is just like a Mech 500, like a Mech 600 Junior. It's mm-hmm. no different except for this collet sizing feature. That So they t- they call these size masters. They're, uh, I have two of them. They're SM32s is the model. So like I said, it's identical to a, a 600 Junior. The difference is it has that, that collet sizing feature, and that's really nice, especially if you're looking for something really versatile that maybe you might convert from two and three quarter to three inch. Um, it's, it's a really nice feature. It does cost a bit more. So if you're looking at the presses, you're, you're going to be looking at a difference of probably 80 to a hundred, hundred bucks to okay. get that collet sizing feature. Now, is that worth <clears throat> it? Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't pay retail for any of my stuff. The one that I have here, I bought brand new. I just, I found it at a shop that was sitting there for years. I paid 150. Okay. So for me, yeah, it was absolutely worth it. But I have loaded many, many, many rounds on a 600 Junior. I don't actually load shot shells progressively because I find that I can load a box of shells in about five minutes, six minutes. Yeah. So yeah, sort of thing in the mandal. They say if you get good at it, you can do about 175 shells an hour. If you're humming along pretty quick, you're oh just, yeah, you know. I, I I easily think you could do one one fifty to two hundred depending on your your skill level. It's just okay. not like metallic. It you know, you can yeah. be a little bit more forceful and sloppy, if you will. As long as you're not spilling components, you can kind of work at a quicker pace with the plans of getting done sooner. It's not like metallic where you're just being especially like what I'm doing, you know, uh uh precision rounds. You know, you're every you're weighing every little thing. You're being really perfect. It's just not like that with a shot shell reloading, you know. Uh, I do have a couple questions for you after this here. Uh, real quick, uh, Pat Hirsch is joining in. Pat, what's going on, man? How you doing? Let's see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there I'm he is. Doing pretty good. Uh, actually, I am joining you from the field, um, but I, I missed out on last week because I was in the field, and so I... I was like, well, I'm in a good reception spot, so I'll just uh, hopefully be able to jump in if I don't lose the touch. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Hey, you be safe, okay? <laughs> don't let those cattle get away from you, all right? <laughs> all right, man. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be fine. <laughs> all right, cool. You missed, you missed a real good bracket last night there, Pat. We had the uh, the candy bracket, Pat, yeah. last night on the, the Easter candy. Was, it, it was a I've slugfest. There were people that got hurt the- feelings or people crying at the end of it. I mean, it was, <laughs> I was upset and furious. I couldn't even go to sleep last night after we got done. <laughs> I'm gonna, hey, you know what? Hey, uh, Rich, I think you got you got a blue wrench for this this podcast. You should put a link to your show over there so people can watch it. What one? Of, uh, candy oh no! Don't say it. You gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. We can't give it. You gotta. You gotta listen to at least the last half of it if you want to find out what, what the winning candy was. Okay. Well, when, when I get out of the field, I will definitely do that. All right. So if you guys want something funny to listen to, we we argued Easter candy last night for what two hours over on Rich White Show. So make sure you guys check it out. Um, okay. Okay. So back to the, back to the idea of shot shell reloading. Okay. So I've you know I've got the holes. I've got the I've got the shells, the primers, the powder. I've got the shot. I'm going off my manual. Um, what is the difference between high brass and low brass for somebody who's never heard of those terms before? What do you need to know? So so high brass. Um, you know, there, there's a high brass. Here's a uh, steel shot uh, waterfowl load. Um, th- this brass. This is basically made for for more pressure. Now you, you know you can load a high pressure round in low brass. Uh, the difference is it's it, it's probably not going to hold up as well because you will get a lot of swelling in these. When you go to size these, but you know you're sizing them if you're running them through a non-collet sizing, so like a standard 600. Mm-hmm. Um, and your powder charge is much higher in high brass. You know, low brass powder is only a little bit above it. With uh, high brass, you know, you I'm using 36 grains of powder in these things. So it fills up. It fills up real quick. I mean, you don't have much room after a wad and shot. It's and the okay. shot cups are completely different on those. Um, but that's you can have high brass, you know, two and three quarter inch, three inch, three and a half inch, twelve gauge, and then you know, I mean, you have it in basically every other gauge too. I don't know much about sixteen gauge though. Okay. Uh, question for you: the the bar and the bushings. What is the big deal about that on your on your uh, reloading press? And then why should somebody really pay attention to what they're doing with it? 
Because the bushing, you know Travis. Let me yeah. take one of these uh, bars out real quick. So I okay. Can show you. Okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah. So, guys, if you have questions, uh, make sure that you go ahead and put it up on the uh, the chat tonight over there on the YouTube side. And as we see the questions pop up, we'll definitely make sure we ask uh, John over here the questions so that we can get through them for you. So, yeah, hopefully we would have missed anybody and, and see what's going on here. Let's see. <laughs> a guy that comments says, hi, Brass is top military officials. Yeah, that's probably it. Hey, Rich, put that link in there. I want you guys to watch that, uh, watch that show tonight before you go to bed. You're going to get a kick out of it. It's pretty good. All right, so yeah. you have a couple options here. Um, so here, here's the bar. Okay. okay. Now, when you when you pick one of these up, you're going to see a, a code on here. Okay, so 302 is the model that you would run this in, meaning any 600 junior or mm -hmm. size master or whatever. If it says 502, it'll be the progressive version of that. Now the bottom, you're going to see three three letter uh, three numbers. Uh, that's mm -hmm. one one eight. That means ounce and an eighth. Okay. Oh, so okay. That, okay. That that is fixed, Travis. So what you see here, this hole right here, that's that is you, you can't change that. They don't have bushings for shot. I don't 100 percent know why. They just haven't done that. This is the way they've always done bars. And then your bushing for your powder is changeable in all bars, and they use the same bushings in all and then they these go by number and you you pretty much you would do this just like you would do any like uh any any sort of like if you use like lee auto drum or something like that or, or auto disc where you you know it'll it'll give you a little pamphlet it'll tell you hey you want 19 grains of red dot use bushing 28 but you might put a 28 in and find i'm only getting 17 and a half you might have to go to a 30 so those are really th those types of guides are, are really just a suggestion basically I, yeah. always, I mean obviously you should always be checking your your powder yeah yeah because the powder cut might be slightly different that you know when they checked it at the factory the cut was a little bit thicker so that's what they found work then but maybe it was a little thinner by the time you got it and, and you need the next size bushing up so so for people that don't understand the idea of the bushing it's basically like a restriction tube that limits the amount of powder that can go into your shell if you've got a more yep. restricted tube you're going to get less less plus powder yep. in your shell per cycle essentially is what's happening right yeah yep okay and so your your bottle your 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 bottles with with your uh, your powder and shot bottles are the same. It's basically going to sit on top of that, and it's just going to swipe that over. Okay. So it's it'll only let it take whatever fits in that in that little uh, void. Now, one of my my uh, one of my favorite recommendations that I, I typically suggest, and I'm not real into the mech bushings that work well. I use them in my 410 gauge because I just run half ounce loads. I only make two and a half inch. Um, but my favorite upgrade, and I just can't recommend these enough, is what you see right here is an adjustable charge bar. Oh, you guys see the, okay. do you see that little dial right there? The one on the end there on the right? Yep, yep. So okay. you can dial in the shot. You can dial the shot and powder on both sides. Okay. So this thing is pretty much infinite for what you what you want to make so you you know do you want to dial it in for you know one ounce you want to dial it in ounce and eight you want to do ounce and a half two ounces whatever you have a lot of options the only downfall to these types of charge bars they tend to fit a hair on the loose side you get a tiny bit of powder leakage sometimes and the other thing is because it's not a um because th this is a big thing the they are not round like like these bushings, you don't get as a consistent of a powder drop, but if you use the powder baffle, use a powder, so this is a baffle, and this actually has a bunch of different, uh, like, little gates in it, kind of like a exhaust muffler or something. And what it does is it helps be a lot more consistent. So I can get it, like, kind of plus or minus a tenth of a grain, maybe two tenths at most with that baffle so that's the only thing i've noticed i need to run something like that when i'm running that charge bar but on a positive note if you buy that adjustable charge bar it typically comes with that baffle okay. or something similar to it 
Um, so we got a couple questions that are popping up over here on the uh, the YouTube side real quick. Uh, Kevin Jones says, what is your recommendation on 1200 and up on 12-gauge shotgun shell for better cycling? Okay, so he's probably talking a semi-auto. And sometimes they do have issues with uh, cycling lower pressure loads. So uh, the Remington loads that I typically buy, when I, I, I like these hulls, but I like the green ones. Um, they're usually 1145. They're real low pressure. They're awesome when you're shooting it over and under, so you don't quite get that recoil. But in some semi-autos that are especially a little finicky or maybe they're more hunting-oriented, they need a little bit more gas to cycle. Uh, my recommendation for anything like that is this powder right here, and this is Hodgson Clay's. So they, make, they have plenty of 1200 and 1250 recipes, they're going to be a little bit on the hot side. So, you know, maybe if you're shooting 300 rounds that day doing trap or something like that, yeah, you might feel it in an over and under, but it, it's a pretty soft recoiling powder. Another really good one is uh, Green Dot. That's another real good one. They've got plenty of recipes up to 1,300 because you can actually make some uh, field loads. And, you know, if that's really what you wanted to shoot sporting clays or something with, you absolutely could. And then here's another old school option. This is another old powder. It's called Herco. You can make some 1,300 recipes with this one. This is actually more of a field-based powder. It's a little bit of a bulky powder, too. It'll really help fill the space. But this would be a good one if you're looking for something a little bit warmer. The other option is with shotguns, depending on what you have, you can also change uh, springs and things like that to... Or, or gas pistons and, and stuff like that. So I know some, like 1187s, or maybe it's 1100s, came with actually two gas pistons, one for three-inch mags and then one for two and three-quarter. Okay. So is there – okay, this is just a request from the YouTube side. If you can't do this, I understand, and I'm fine if you want to. Is there any way you could take us through loading an actual shell? Yeah, I absolutely not, can. Manufacturing components, we're showing how to reload, which is different from – so this doesn't violate YouTube's policies. But yeah, absolutely. Why don't you yeah. guys – why don't you guys just have a chat and I'll set this press up and, and we'll make a couple shells. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So uh, let me just go back here on the YouTube side and we'll see uh, what's going on here. Uh, let's see. Midnight Range DM says Travis P11. Are the green ones lime or sour, sour apple flavored? I know the red ones are strawberry. Uh, Midnight Range will have to go back and see what uh, what we're talking about here. Rich White, what are you guys talking about over there? What is that? The flavors of the shotgun shell hauls. Oh, the flavors of the shells. Okay. Well, we didn't debate those last night on the show. So that's why I didn't know. So, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Cost difference between reloading non lead versus lead. Oh, that's a good one, too. Uh, let's see. We'll try to get that answer for you also when uh, when John comes back here. You know, just overall, you know, depending on, you know, your, your, your lowest cost production shotgun ammo that you buy off the shelves. What I've been reading in the, the reloading handbook is, you know, you're not going to expect to save a ton of money. Uh, you know, you might save 50 cents or a dollar a box. There's a lot of people that posted questions over on Amazon when I was reading about the MEX 600 press. And they said, hey, how much am I really going to save? And, and a lot of it comes down to, well, you know, just to reload an identical shell to what you're buying. If it's just some inexpensive, you know, target ammo off the shelf, uh, some skeet, skeet ammo off the shelf, you're not going to save a ton of money. Um, but I really, I'm, I'm not really sure about that caliber. So try to get you kind of a cost per shell difference between the two. I guess if we look at the cost of the ammo on the shelf, just like two similar shells, one's lead and one's not, we might have a right, we might have a bit of an idea about it too. So, uh, let's see Caliber 32 special says Reese's eggs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. uh, let's see here. Any other questions popping up right now? Uh, let's see here. Show started the same time as normal. Yeah, the date was wrong for some reason. I thought I had it saved, unfortunately, and it uh, was not where it should have been. So I had it. I thought I had it marked down for the 13th instead of the 11th for some reason. Shore Lane makes a reloadable adapter that takes 309 primers. Works like a muzzle loader type, great for breakover shotguns. Sounds good. And I'm kind of curious about this myself. You know, for somebody like myself who's going to be starting up a summer trap league here. Um, I'm going to be going through lots and lots of shells and it might, you know, within a couple hours, I might be able to reload what I shot from the previous weekend or the previous few weekends. So I'm looking at saving a little bit of money myself. Of course, you know, I've got to get the press and get set up again, but there's a lot of little things that I have. Uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet were the, uh, calipers. You might want to get yourself some calipers just to check consistency on the crimp and the shell length. 
you also want to make sure you get yourself a good digital scale. One thing about the digital scales, and I didn't, you know, we talked about digital scales last week. I've got the, I think it was the Frankfurt or Frankfurt Armory uh, digital scale. And you need to make sure that you get a scale that goes up to at least a thousand grains, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think the Frankfurt one that I have goes that high. So if you're going to be weighing your shells or weighing your powder, doing powder checks, you may want to uh, make sure that you get a scale that goes up above that, uh, that goes past like a 500 grain capacity for measurement. So let's see, Alaskan or Pat or Rich, do you guys have any questions at all? At this point for uh, for John, or anything you guys want to say about shot shells in general? Well, I just wanted to say that um, you do really save money when you go to buying 15 and $20 a box shot shells uh, for ducks and stuff like that, or maybe your high brass, high loads for um, hunting other game, you know, number fours and turkey loads and stuff like that. You save a ton of money, and so... Yeah, you don't save a lot on your $4.50 skeet shell that won't even cycle most semi-autos. But when you get into your high brass and your, your high loads, you really save a lot of money. Plus, you can custom waterproof them, which I think John is going to go over later. And yeah, you can yeah. do all that kind of stuff as well. And it's, it's just a, a lot. And the, like we, we did custom loading when I did it um, for coyotes. And really, I loaded these for home defense during the last uh, Obama run of uh ammo sandy hook run but uh we loaded uh eight pellets of number four buckshot and th three quarters of an ounce of number four copper plated shot in a two and three quarter inch high brass Ooh. and the best home defense load out there and i don't know how many dead coyotes we had because they'd run across these small food plots in georgia uh when i lived there and they would just you know, you couldn't track them with an AR-15, so you just throw your shotgun on them, and, and 50, 60 yards with the full choke is not impossible with that yeah. kind of load. So, yeah, yeah, you know, the, I never thought about the idea of, of custom manufacturing your own uh, self-defense rounds, too. That's something I never thought of. You're putting together. Yeah, you guys see the price on that? So nine ninety nine. Okay, is that for buckshot? That's, what is that for? That's for five. Number The three-inch number two buckshot for a 20 gauge. Oh, my God. This is what I got for my uh, mom. Yeah, see, you, you you could make something like that for. Yeah. You could probably make that for a third of the price if I were to take a guess. Yeah. If you buy probably. buckshot. Yeah, probably. I don't have uh, the loading supplies or anything. I really don't have anywhere to do it either right now. So, hey. You uh, know, you can. Go ahead, John. You, you know, they make. Uh, they're called Lee Loaders, and they're a little manual. Do it by hand with a hammer. You actually don't need a press. A little piece of two by four or something like that. You can watch videos. I mean, you're not going to make it fast, but if you wanted to make little boutiques like that, you could certainly do it. it Cost you about twenty five bucks. Twenty bucks to probably get into something like that. What would be before we get into to showing off how this works? What would be the the kind of the primary difference in in manufacturing your own slug rounds versus the shot rounds? What step would be different in the process? If a person's going to reload their own slug well, shells, you know, their I, own slug I, round. I've I've done I've done less slugs. I've done a little bit of slugs. You got a couple options. You can do the type that load very similar to a a shot round, where you're actually going to cover it with a crimp, and then you the most common, which is where you know, like if you buy your own slugs, you actually see it. That's called a roll crimp. And I don't have that tool because I don't roll crimp anything because it's it's basically once and for all, but. Mm. Basically, okay. it's, it's a little aluminum mandrel, and you put it on a drill or a drill press, and you actually it actually heats the plastic up and makes it curl in. Oh, like okay. That, and okay. You, you can kind of adjust your depth, however, wh however you want. Basically, it's all it's all by feel. Okay. Okay. Cool, so man. The the one thing before we get started, so I can give you guys a little bit of a, an idea of this is I, I'll show you guys a couple different types of wads. Um, this is going to be a real, this will be a real common one. And this is a Winchester double A. Uh, okay. This is a really common wad. So when you guys go and you buy a set of a shotgun shell, you know, when you buy the cheap Winchesters at Walmart for five, six bucks a box, buddy, it's not coming with double A wads. Okay. <laughs> you know, you've got to buy the eight, nine, $10 a box to get these wads. 
So that's why I said it's just it's not all created equal. You know, there's a big difference between a Remington Core Lock and a Nosler Acubon. What is the what is the the AA rating then for somebody who doesn't know with the A AA? What's the different rating systems and what's that all about? The the AA the AA wad is I mean like when it comes to a rating is now there's different uh, there's different depths and stuff. So if you were you can actually get like you have to measure these cups. Okay, you can actually get these that they're shorter, so they're meant more of what they'll call a field grade, okay. meaning meaning you can you put more powder in there. So this empty space right here, this little shock absorber portion, they'll actually shrink that, so you can actually get more powder and hole. Now this is your standard, you know, you're going to run 19, 21 grains of some sort of red dot, green dot, uh, powder. Know, yeah, yeah, a, a standard, a standard, you know, Hodge and Clay's universal some sort of standard powder that's what their length of the wad is designed and now so like i said that's only going to come in a premium a premium uh shell now here's what i'd recommend for any of you guys that are really considering this now this is called clay buster and what these guys do is they basically take um they take and make replicas uh, doesn't that look just like a double A? <laughs> yeah, it's almost identical to it. It's basically to enough to not get copyright infringement or patent infringement. You but, know, I don't yeah. know if they pay royalties or something. I don't want to tell you, but <laughs> yeah. these are going to run you about half the price of real double A's. And I'm going to tell you right now, they work just as good. I've patterned them. I, I mean, if there's a difference, it's by two or three percent, and it's something we can't see. Okay, and I, got, I do have a question for you. This is from Calaveras32 Special. He wanted to know what is like the price savings or what is the price difference in loading lead versus steel shot if we can have two comparative loads? Can you give us an idea as how much you're actually going to save on one versus the other? Or are well, they about the same or what, what could you say about that? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. Okay, so that's a tough <laughs> one. So yeah. it's really going to go by the wads you use, the powder. Okay. okay. The pr primer, you're not probably going to see a huge difference. You know, it might be a cent or two a shot. What's going? What you'll see a big difference with. Let me grab. So let me grab a steel shot, steel shot wad real quick. And this okay. would be any. This will go for anybody that's doing like turkey loads or something as well. So, if you guys notice, there was a big shock absorber on those double A's. So what do you guys see on that one? You don't see anything. Look at that. A big oh, empty yeah, hole. A big cup. Yeah. So the reason that is is because obviously steel is, what, two-thirds of density of lead, if, is it, if it's even that much, half the density. So you need a hell of a lot more space to get an ounce. In a, this, so this is designed to hold up to an ounce and three-eighths of number four uh, steel. So if you put lead in here, you're probably going to get close to – Two ounces, ounce and seven eighths. You're going to get a lot of lead in here. Um, the other thing is with steel, you need to go to a bigger pellet size to get the same downrange energy as a smaller lead size. So you know, kind of your your standard rule of thumb is a, a number a number six lead probably hits like a number four steel. Okay, it, it might even be worse than that. Steel's not very effective. Okay, it, the, so that that's. I think he said he was asking for like a, like a duck load, like a good duck load or something like that. You know, having to go lead versus non lead, you know, cost savings and stuff. Or well, the yeah, there 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 is a cost savings. It's it's the same thing, Travis, with the you know buying a, a premium steel shot load because I'm you know I'm obviously a duck hunter, but you know you can buy thirty dollar a box shells, you can buy ten dollar a box shells. So what I loaded right here is with those same wads I showed you guys, but this is a duplex load. And I actually have number one nickel uh, zinc plated steel on the bottom and then uh, number twos on the top. So that's an ounce and a quarter. And I got this sucker humming at 1,500 feet per second. Oh, wow. You can't buy that in the store. I have okay. yet the factory federals that they load are doing 1450 and I weighed the charge of five of them. And none of them were an actual true ounce and a quarter of number twos. So this, this one hits like a sledgehammer. For, for steel anyway it's not, it's not going to knock anything dead like lead but it's, okay. it's pretty effective the savings on that you're looking about 10 bucks a box to make it the way i just showed you guys there because uh, no, you're using a lot of components okay okay another question for you here and this is a good one what about using regular bbs like you would use in a bb gun free loading shot shells 
What if I what if I told you I already do that? Hey, all right, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I mean, that's kind of expensive, though, isn't it, to buy a tub like that at Walmart? Or uh, not? These are six bucks. These okay. are six bucks, and if you do the math, if you do the math, um, it's it's about the same price as if you go and order steel. Okay. In a because it usually comes in ten pound bags, uh, it's yeah. right about the same price. Uh-huh. Now. I'd probably still tell you to just go and buy the steel this way. Uh, steel it, shot. It is, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit better stuff. You know, it's okay. a little bit more round. This is really round. Don't get me wrong. These are good. And mm-hmm. this is what my uncle loads for duck honey. He buys the copperheads. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's yeah. what he loads. And I know because I have, you know, copper plated BBs stuck in my decoy so i i know oh, yeah. him, but <laughs> Dude, i used to shoot those all the time when i was a kid i, I love the first uh, i used to get the copperheads for my bb guns yeah they're real convenient you know every time he goes to walmart because he shoots a 10 gauge he's going through an ounce and five eighths of pellets every time he loads a shell <laughs> so you know every time you go to walmart you just pick up a six thousand count of bbs and you make a couple boxes of shells and i don't so, see those selling out there, right there now is, walmart. Uh, unless you're walmart another does... one here yeah yeah yeah, the only thing you got to be careful with steel, guys, and this is kind of a, this is honestly a really big deal, and this is the one thing a lot of people don't talk about, is the thickness of this shot cup. It's really, this is a really high-density plastic, okay? And when you take something like like these, these are really frail, okay? okay. They're very thin. So if you were to load steel in this, the steel is absolutely going to rub through, and you are going to see little holes if you go pick up the wad down range, and you're going to probably get scoring on your barrel. Now, it's not going to happen the first couple. It'll probably take quite a few shots. But if you ever see a steel shot wad, it's very thick, very high, de- high density plastic, because you don't want that steel to rub through. Obviously, steel on steel, you're going to get scratches and things like that. Now, this is now, a question the, I have for you, then. Yeah. Uh, in terms of choke tubes, there are some choke tubes where you should not run steel through them, and there are some where you can do lead only. Or, yeah. Is that so, true the choke tubes? Yeah. It's it's absolutely true. Um, so you got to be careful. you got some of them older guns, and they're fixed chokes, especially considering back then they didn't use shot cups, okay? They actually used to use base wads, drop the shot, and then cover it um, – you know, with an overshot card or something like that. So the yeah. lead was actually contacting. So you used to, a full choke back then would be comparable to an extra full screw in choke okay. because we use, we use Watts. Um, okay. So they used to fill the space with like different discs, you know, like maybe felt or cardboard or something of that nature, uh, wax, wax cardboard or something like that to make it waterproof. But, you know, yeah, you've you, you got to be careful with that. You better make sure, like, when you're running a full choke. So there's a big difference between a steel full and a full choke, I, I can assure you. The common rule of thumb is that if you're using a standard choke, that you're one size up on constriction running steel. Steel doesn't compress. Steel is not forgiving like lead. When you are loading steel, even as long as I've been doing shotgun and the experience I have, I still, every once in a while will crush a a uh, shell and steel right here the plastic above the steel mm-hmm. the 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 base it'll actually fold and buckle out on you because it's so darn hard to final crimp these because the steel just doesn't compress you really got to take your time and not force it like you could never load 200 rounds an hour on steel you you I, I hand you hand weigh everything. It's really hard mm. to get the shot to drop the way you want, the powder to drop the way you want. So you'll notice a lot of guys if you research it, really just use their machines to final crimp and uh, pre crimp and final crimp. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh let's see. Alaskan Bliscus, you got a question for us, bud? Thought maybe he had clicked on the the hand or something. He might have been uh, yeah. clicking on our. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is it any better loading like other types of non toxic like bismuth and uh, other uh, like tungsten, non- tungsten, tungsten and tungsten stuff like that? Is, yeah. Or yeah. is it is it any yep. easier so, to steal? Absolutely. So so tungsten won't be tungsten is hard. Tungsten is very hard. So it would be more like steel. Now bismuth, on the other hand, is actually soft, kind of like lead. Uh, typically it's more of like a powder form and then they use like some sort of polymer 
or something like that to actually shape a pellet and it's actually malleable like lead so they it's it's a great lead alternative but it will cost you a heck of a lot more money to load it but i i have used a little bit of bismuth and i really like the way it hits birds but it, it is it's three times the cost to go buy a box of shells now if you load it yeah it's cheaper but man you're still going to be 20 some bucks for for 25 rounds it's it's just that's it's what, still uh, not super affordable yet. So Calabaris was saying he hates buying all the non-lead uh, filler yeah. when you got it when it comes time to actually buy it because it's uh, so pricey. Yeah, it's so pricey, and I I just stick with steel. You know, I'm not the world's greatest shot, and I mean I'm actually a pretty decent shot, but it seems like with steel you fire, you pull the trigger a lot, but not a lot of stuff falls. I think your patterns are really blown because you don't have many pellets because you're using such a big pellet, and I think they just kind of get away unscathed. You know. Okay. Um, and here's the one last spot I wanted to show yeah, you, Travis. Yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a, yeah. This is a neat one. This would be a good one for somebody like yourself who's who's just getting into it. And this is called a wind jammer, and this has seals in different places. So it's got a seal here, a seal here, and then a seal here, and then it has all these slits in the in the uh, cup to actually lower pressure. And what this is, this is a super versatile wad, and you can load this in almost any damn shell you pick up. Now you'll have to, you know, kind of toy around with it see what see what crimson stuff worked for you this is a really good wad and they made this came up with this idea years ago and it actually works pretty good it it patterns well it's really versatile that's a clay buster i think it's like a clay buster exclusive wad and that's who makes that i've loaded you know many many of those so I have not gotten past the first 25 pages of the book. I got through the introduction they talk about the different tools that you need you know and the presses and um do they tell you which wad you're supposed to use too when you're when you're going Absolutely. into? They have wad recommendations. Oh, yeah. yep, they do. Yep. So, All right. So All right. when you when you get there, you're going to see stuff like oh when wad you column. Pick one of these up, yeah, it'll tell you wad All column right. and okay, and it'll give you the CB eleven hundred twelve, and that's basically that's a knockoff, um, you know, double A. And then here's another really common one that probably worked for the halls that you were talking about, your Fiokis. Yeah. I'd recommend I'd recommend these because I believe a. A Fiocchi is a straight wall haul, and I'll get into that in, in a second. And these okay. are called 12S3s. And this is a federal wad column, and this is basically designed for a straight wall haul. Okay. And I'll show you here real quick. When I was talking to you Saturday, I did some cutaways for, you, yeah, for your viewers. Yeah. yeah. Here is a, uh, a straight wall haul. So do you guys see all this room in here? And there's just that tiny little base wad. See how it's straight all the way down to the bottom? Mm -hmm. Now, here's a Winchester double. You guys see that? The base wad's real high, and it's tapered at the bottom. Okay. So when okay. this this will not load that 12S3 wad. It will load the wind jammers. It will obviously load a double A, and it will load other, other wads. But straight wall... Um, hulls are a bit more difficult and these have a lot of room in and they're they're hard to fill all that space these are real easy to fill and the STSs are also a similar construction they have a taper at the bottom too those are those are my favorite the gold and the green ones but the difference is with these well, sorry with the STSs these don't have they don't have as bad of a taper these have this really crazy high up plastic base and you can't even get a wad to go past that so I really just kind of I only load certain wads in the double A's and I that's why I've gravitated toward the Remingtons because actually I should have cut one of those in half, but mm. it's it's a one piece haul and it does have a slight taper, but it's not a real aggressive taper. So you can actually use almost any wad in it within reason. I mean you gotta gotta do your research. And you'll also notice in your book, Travis, you may not find every recipe you're looking for. You may have to use Hodgson. You may have, if you're yeah, an alliance yeah, powder yeah, guy, yeah. you will have probably 95% of what you need in there. But unfortunately, some of the tougher, you know, when you're trying to use a straight wall uh, uh, wad, like those 12 S3s in a semi taper, like the, like the Remington holes, you'll find that a lot of times they don't want to give you data for that. But if you go other places, you'll find it. Because I think it's you get the, slightly higher pressure. The ReloadersNetwork.com is the place we were talking about last week, too, is a really good website to go to. And that they've got, uh, there's guys that are part of that that have videos over on YouTube about reloading. You can check out also. So that's one to go into. 
So, yeah. yeah, there's a ton of resources out there. But, you know, this is good oh, just yeah. for getting started with just knowing oh, the primary components, off-the-shelf components, just the basics of getting into I, it. So I've got creases all over those pages going back to them and referencing them. And like oh, yeah. I said to you, I bought that Ballistics Products. Uh, they sell their own mans. Like I said, they're real, real big into marketing, so you got to be careful. I bought this. It's called the Status of Steel. This is just for steel. This was the absolute biggest waste of $20 I've ever spent <laughs> because – it just doesn't give me the information I want, and they're just too darn conservative. When you're trying to make high-power, you know, magnum shotgun shells, their charges are so low, 1,300 feet per second. Well, I can buy box ammunition for that, so that thing really didn't help me at all. And it might be a liability issue, too. They don't want to give somebody that's, you know, yeah, the wrong kind of data and because they know you're going to probably tweak it anyway once you get good enough oh, into yeah, the I'm, loading itself. I'm so. like six or eight grains above their max and i'm not getting any pressure signs on my hulls primers or anything it's just it's so conservative to a point where the shells when you shoot them you feel like you're shooting a a target shell from walmart and it's like well that's that's when you're shooting a, a you know a magnum load you should know you're shooting a magnum load oh yeah yeah you'll definitely tell all right, man. So uh, go ahead and take us through just kind of the basic process. So let's just pretend that we've we've read the books. We're then again, this is not just like what we said last week. This is not something you should rush into. You want to take your time when you do this. Uh, you want to make sure you read the manuals. You want to make sure you educate yourself on it. Um, now you've obviously got a little bit different setup than the Mech Six Hundred Junior that I'm looking at, but this is just kind of what your average person might run into, right? Well, if you see me, I mean, basically, Travis, the only thing you're going to really Notice difference for my press right here versus the Mech 600 you're mm -hmm. looking at is really just the sizing portion here. Now, when I get home, I typically size these and and dump the primers right away. And I, I try to get this step out of the way. So when I reload, I typically start with a a sized a sized hole. But I mean, really, you just you drop this in. And that's one of the nice things about that collet style. And you just go down. And it's going to size that, squeezes squeezes this metal base. It'll put a slight taper on, meaning you can run this then in any semi-auto, a pump, um, you know, over and under or whatever. Okay, so how do you get the primers out? Do you have a different press that you use for that when well, you first this, get them home? Or This, yeah. this right here oh. has a pin on it, and it'll okay. actually pop that primer out. And it'll zoom come in out on you. And it'll come out a little uh, tray in the very bottom. So it's kind of two steps in one. It'll decap. And it'll size your uh, size your uh, your base, and then this is an automatic primer feed. This setup, yeah, you could yeah. Put, you could put one of these on your Mech Six Hundred. It's the same yep. exact primer feed, and I'm going to tell you, I, I absolutely recommend this. It's worth the extra sixty bucks or whatever. I, I guarantee you, you'll thank me. Okay. So, anyways, every time you crimp. Every time you final crimp, it'll actually drop a primer in, and you're boom, you're ready to go. So it's it's really it's really nice. Okay. So, anyways, then you just you put this up in here. The primer's in. You come down. You seat the seat the primer. Okay. These are Chedite primers, so I typically buy whatever's cheapest. I can get these at Cabela's, buck uh, eighty eight for a hundred, or you can buy. A thousand for twenty five. So I buy them loose because it's cheap. Or somebody clearly didn't didn't math well that day. <laughs> they didn't do the math right. Yeah. Now, if you <laughs> order them online, is there are there hazmat fees for primers? If oh, unfortunately, yeah, there is hazmat fees for primers. But if you buy, you go to ballistics products and you buy hulls that are primed, you don't have to pay a hazmat fee. So that's kind of convenient. So if you wanted to get started and just kind of get. Get the ball rolling and try new hauls. You know, just once, maybe buy a hundred. You don't mm -hmm. have to pay any hazmat fees, so it might be a good way to to get your your feet wet and something like that. Well, and yeah, I've seen that like Brown Elk. Yeah, Brown Elk does the one cent hazmat fees once in a while too. Yeah, yeah that's well, nice every too. So often, every so often, not just shooting supply, they'll have no uh, hazmat fees whatsoever. To look, they're one one of their big sales. You may want to check that too. Yeah, I haven't bought many components online, guys, because. I have enough resources around me that I, I just kind of keep looking because I, I never seem to be looking for powder primers when there's the no hazmat fees. And then the other thing I've noticed is a lot of them companies have been getting expensive like Midway. You know, that Hodgson Clays I paid at a local gun shop 15 bucks less, not to mention I didn't have to pay shipping or hazmat fees. So I've, I've really been kind of just sticking away from, from the, the Midways. They seem to, be, seem to be going up in price a lot. 
So the next thing is we're going to take this, take the wad. We're going to take the wad. We're not putting it in yet. We're going to drop this, drop this uh, ram down. We're going to flip the charge bar over. It drops shot. It drops a uh, powder in. We're just going to take the shot cup, get it started. We're going to push that down, go over like that, and you guys will see shot in there. So the powder did go through. Yep. And then you got a shot on the top. Okay. Okay. Yep. So so All on right. this so on this station here. So the number one, you're you're gonna size and deep prime. This station you're only going to prime. This station you're doing three steps. You're dropping shot first. Sorry, geez, powder first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then then you lift the ram back up. You put a, a a hole. You put a wad in here, and that's called a wad guide. Then you push your your wad in place. Then, while you're holding down, you flip your charge bar over to the right and you drop your shot. And if you if you notice, hopefully you guys can see that I have the, the yeah, shot yeah. is right at the top of this cup. Okay, right at the top. It's so I'm getting like a good ounce and an eighth charge. You could go a little less, go a little bit more if you're trying to save or make a little bit higher power load. This next station is called a pre crimp and that's where you're actually just starting that that little star pattern the next station in the back is the final crimp and this comes down i'll actually drop a primer okay in this cup like i was like i was telling you oh, cool that's what's okay. really neat about that and then that is a final now this hull's pretty beat up so it's not the sexiest crimp you've ever seen but nonetheless it's a good nice closed crimp it's got a good, uh, nice taper here. It's not belled out at the top or anything. So if you're going to run this in a semi-auto or a pump or anything like that, you won't have any problems. Sometimes when things get worn, you'll actually get a little bell at the top, and they won't run in them well. And then that's what kind of having an over and under is better. Then it'll, it'll take even, even boogered up crimps that'll, it'll accept, and that's kind of nice about them. How many times on average can you use like some of them holes? I know it's going to depend on the manufacturer, the the, yeah. the thickness of the the plastic, the quality yeah, of the plastic, the, you know. So, so what what I tell you what what I've known, what what I've learned is the green Remingtons. I I don't know what their lifespan is. I'm going to tell you it's ten to twelve. Um, okay. If you're loading hot, hot. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you might only get six to eight. If you're loading middle of the road like me, twelve hundred, you're probably all day long going to get ten to twelve. The gold ones, I find about a solid 10. Uh, double A's, if they're red or the silver ones like these, you'll, you should get 6 to 10 out of them. The orange double A's suck. You get less loads than some of the real cheap shells. Um, so And so before you go to the store and buy uh, spent holes, you know, once fired holes, uh, good idea you said to check on Facebook or check on uh, Craigslist, see if anybody's selling them. Estate yep. sales, maybe some some auctions, possibly. Um, you know, because I'm thinking of like, you know, sometimes we got the old the old couple that they have their estate auction, and you see the guns going up for sale. There's a chance of reloading supplies might pop up. Also, you might find some presses and some of the components and stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. That's I, I'm real big on checking the the classifieds. Like I said, I'm, I'm more of an opportunist reloader. It's one of the reasons I have all the equipment that I have. Mm -hmm. is I, you know, like this press right here, you know, you're, you're looking about 310 bucks new sell all day long for probably high twos. I paid 150 brand new. I have another one of these I could show you guys that I actually restored. It's probably 25, 30 years old and had a lot of rust and stuff and I actually restored it. And, you know, I might have 20 bucks into it and it's a completely wow. functional press. I didn't need it, but for the amount I have into it, it was worth having to me. I actually thought about maybe converting it to a different gauge or maybe just making it my steel shot press. Cause actually I don't use this press here for steel. This is just my, my trap or skeet or, or uh, sporting clays loads. I you'll find with mechs that, or any <clears throat> shot compressed for that matter, it's not quite as quick to change over and dial in as it is something like metallic. And you'll find once you find something that works for you, that, you, you probably just want to keep it that way. And that's why it's really common to see somebody like me that has four or five mechs because I'll buy them secondhand and, and set them up for a specific situation and I'll leave them that way. Okay. Um, man, that's some good information, dude. Um, 
yeah, can you take us through a couple more shells again? Can you Absolutely. run through that again? Yeah, this is this is great. Yeah. yeah. Again, this is not this is not an instructional step by step video. This is just showing you what the process entails. All right. Yeah. yeah. Quick, I did have a question about calls. Um, sure. I don't know if uh, it got asked or not because I've been having to jump in and out. But um, have you tried the brass ones? And if so, how long? How many times can you reload those ones? You know. Well, I, well, you mean like a whole brass hall? Yeah, like the Winchester, yeah, I, like Winchester has uh, some brass halls that some of their uh, rounds are loaded in, like their yeah. uh, World War II commemorative ones. Yeah, on I've never, those. I've never done a whole bunch with with the all brass halls. I've I've watched some videos and things like that. Uh, Larry Potterfield, I watch him kind of, you know, bring some of that old stuff back to life. I don't know a whole bunch about that stuff. I know it's a lot of handwork with like using dowel rods and and buying different types of base wads and things like that to to make that whole setup work. I don't, don't know a whole bunch about that stuff. Okay. No, um, what I, what I will tell you guys though, like, I mean, a little word of ad, advice when it comes to, to shooting, I, I'm going to like, if you ever buy your bucket list gun, like I just did a couple months ago, I bought a Caesar greenie. Um, it's very expensive shotgun. Like oh, luckily my wife doesn't watch these podcasts, but <laughs> <laughs> anyways, like like as much as my daily driver. But anyways, the, the point is that these are brass. So, so you're not going to get the wear on ejectors and extractors that you will with a cheaper shell like this because these are steel, guys. Okay. Okay. It, it, you'll also get a heck of a lot more sizings out of your sizing dies. When you run brass, it's a lot easier to size, obviously, because the, the metal's a lot a lot more malleable than, than steel. So if you're going to get into it, it might be a better idea to buy a higher quality spent shell, a once fired shell, if you're just going to get into it, or maybe try to focus on the more premium ammo that you fired, keeping that, keeping those shells around to start off with. You're going to have yeah. a better experience overall. You, you absolutely you read to, my but mind. It helps. Yeah. yeah, you absolutely read my mind, Travis. I, I have not bought a non-premium shell in probably a year because I reload them, and I don't buy many factory loads. I pretty much just buy them to help me you know, build up my stockpile yeah. as Replace holes wear like out. Through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, if you saw, say you start with 500 holes, man, you're going to get a lot. You're going to get probably, if you start with these green Remingtons, you're probably going to get 5,000 loads out of them. So mm -hmm. 500 is going to last you a pretty darn long time. And it just isn't really worth, you know, messing around with these, these cheapo shells all that much. And anyways, because they have so much of the space in here, mm -hmm. it's just such a pain in the butt to fill that, the very first time I ever tried one, I'll quick show it. Mm -hmm. I got this little cavity in there. You guys, oh see that? wow, yeah, we. I got, I'm so, zoomed in on you right now. So so much space. I had to actually use some of that little sealer in there and hold this together. And what I found out to get a nice crimp like this, you need to use an overshot card. So you now you need to buy another component. And you need to add time, and you got to stuff an overshot card in there before you do it. And here's the other thing that really stinks about these. You guys see that little bell at the top? So yeah. if you're an auto loader guy, you're not going to want to run these. So I, I just, okay. I pretty much gave up on that. Well, and I, I, I picked them out of the trash, loaded 25, and I'm probably not going to load them again. And here's the thing. If you're going to drop this kind of money to get into a decent reloading setup, what's an extra couple bucks to get the premium? I mean, the, the shell is the fuel, right? I mean, Absolutely. you want junk fuel. You want a good containing unit for what you're going to run through your gun. So spend, even if it's maybe maybe 30 40% more to buy higher qualities once spent shells versus garbage shells. Yeah, or, I'm a, I, I'm a you know. huge proponent of the... Buy once, cry once, guy. You yeah. know, I, I yeah. would just rather have one really good Caesar Greeny than, you know, five or six lower quality guns that aren't going to make me happy. And, and that's just kind of the way. And I'm no different with these shells. You know, I'll I'll go spend the eight bucks a box at Walmart for these STSs. But you know what? If I get 10 reloads out of them and you're buying the cheap Federals, you're only getting two. Well, guess what? You're buying more, more uh, holes than I am. So for me... That's that's just kind of the way I see it, and then I, I use my savings in buying the claybuster wads or buying wads from buying seven thousand wads from somebody on a Facebook classified for seventy five bucks, or or buying nine bags of shop for hundred seven. I'm like I said, I'm more of an opportunist reloader. I've been doing that for for a while. 
now I've never done a video on this, but maybe somebody should look into this, or maybe somebody can make one up that's watching this video. Do a video on which uh, spent holes reload the best or the most, like which ones are the highest versus the lowest quality. Yeah, there's actually... I know that just for just basic, you know, just two and three quarter inch twelve gauge shells. Which one makes the best there's reloading real hole? Good, uh, you know, real good resource out there. He's kind of, he's a kind of a funnier guy. His name's Manny Ca, and he actually will do how many times will it load videos and he tests a bunch of different holes down to double a's down to the color and you okay. will find i'm actually in the plastics industry but mm -hmm. um you'll actually find that different colors just don't reload as well the orange double a's man i just throw them right in the trash so okay. when you go and you buy a premium shell make sure you do your research and and i, I think we gave some pretty good information on this podcast that people kind of mm -hmm. know double a's red or silver um, you know, for Remingtons, you're looking gold or, or uh, the metallic green, and those are pretty much going to be your, your top shells on the high end side. And then you have these as an option, and these are clay and field. These are built just like uh, STS, but they have a steel base. So okay. if you want that same quality hull, you can get it. It'll, it'll just, you know, not have the, the brass base. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I want to just make a few announcements here. I want you guys to check out uh, Sarge C4 Defense's channel. He says he's premiering a video on his KM Tactical Bolt Carrier Group that he's been having issues with after my show. So if you guys go over there and check out the C4 Defense uh, channel over there, uh, that's something I want you guys to look into. Also, Night Strike uh, was not able to be here tonight because... Their, his family, their home narrowly avoided a tornado last oh, night, so he is in a bad situation right now, and he's trying to get the generator going and stuff. He uh, sent me some some text messages or some emails with his phone because they don't have electricity where he's at, I guess. In that wow. area, I don't know if it was South Carolina or North Carolina. I can't remember where he's at, but I guess oh, they got South Carolina, got, South Carolina yeah. they got hammered last night. Did they have a lot of tornadoes and stuff, or what? Yeah, there was tornadoes all across the south last night. Yeah, we up here in Nebraska, we've got those cold fronts and those warm fronts that are starting to push through now, too, which produced that wonderful hail that I showed you guys two days ago on Instagram. So if you yeah. check it out. But, well, yeah, so so thoughts for Nice Strike and his family tonight. What's that? Yeah, last, last night and early this morning, we were getting 60-mile-an-hour gusts here. Yeah, it's oh. been real windy here, too. Real, real nasty windy. Yeah, you can tell summer's day. coming in. But, anyway, so those are just a few announcements I wanted to make. Nice Strike wanted to be here tonight, but, unfortunately, was not able to uh, to make that happen. So, so, John, talk us through it. Take us through a couple more shells. And, All right, uh, man. So we yeah, we we, yeah. Uh, we did a the sizing operation, punched a primer out. Um, you guys, you can see it's good, right, Travis? Yeah, yeah. I'm All zoomed right, in so on you right now, so yeah. We're gonna come here, bottom out, load a fit a fit another primer. The truck. Now this is that station where you know you're kind of doing your most work at, and you're just going to push that charge bar over. Okay, so you're that's going to drop the powder, right? Yep, that'll, the powder's that'll there. Drop the Okay, so the powder's okay, down see there. That? And that's uh -huh. green. It's green dot. Um, so put it back up in there in that wad guide. And when you actually come down, you drop the powder, Travis, it's actually going to bring your wad guide, and it actually is kind of securing the shell. Oh, okay. It's a bunch of little fingers that actually will spread the hull apart to get okay. the wad in so you don't you know, jam up your right. uh, lip of your shell. And you just come back down with your, uh, with your ram. You're going to push that wad in. While I'm holding the, the the ram down, I just drop okay. over. Okay. We got shot shots in there. there. All right. Got a kind of a pre crimp, pre I guess you could call it. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Done. And look at that. Now, how often do you kind of audit yourself and weigh the shells or weigh the powder charge or weigh the seal charge to make sure that there's no variance or any kind of a dangerous you know, level I, falling I, into it? Yeah. I have not I have not noticed big variances in anything like that. I think the big thing is this baffle right here, obviously number one. And then over on the shot, it, it's really, you know, you might vary. This stuff isn't perfect. I mean, shotgun yeah, just yeah. isn't it's not like you're 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 not shooting a thousand yards. It's not that kind of thing. So this plus or minus 0 0.1, 0 0.2 grains is pretty common, by the way. That I would consider you dialed in. And the shot, it, it's just you know you're filling that space, and it's it's all it's all based on gravity. Lead's obviously pretty heavy. I find that it's very consistent, and, okay. and I don't vary very much. I, it, it's it's really very little, if if any at all. It's really not enough to get to get you worried, and you know it's good because. If you had a problem, Travis, your crimps aren't going to look good, buddy. If you go, if you don't have enough in there, it's going to cone in. If you have too much, it'll 
the crimp will blow out. So, so you okay, know you got it dialed in. What are some of the common mistakes that you see people make? They get into reloading shot shells. What were some of the mistakes that you made when you first got into it? Just so a person knows maybe what to watch for when they first get started on this. Well, I would say the biggest thing you're going to spend time on in these is getting your pre crimp set up. So, you know, actually, I'm just going to crush one of these holes. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Oh, damn. So, <laughs> so when you get your pre crimp, so if you don't have enough pre crimp, you'll actually affect your final crimp. And if you have too much pre-crimp, it'll affect it, but it won't affect it in a way that it'll probably, you know, botch your shell where it looks bad. So you typically want to close up your, these are, these are a very flexible plastic. That's why they, they, as soon as you, as soon as you come down on it, it'll be closed and then it just starts to open on you right away. It's not a very flexible plastic. Okay. Um, so the thing is with something like that is you want to make sure that you're closed at least halfway on your pre-crimp. If you're not, when it goes to make your final crimp, sometimes we'll get a little hole in the center and shot will pop out of it. Okay, okay. If you don't have enough shot in there or you have the wrong length wad, you'll have too much empty space in there, and then you'll have that one that I showed you guys before. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, this is the correct wad for this recipe. I just don't know how to fill all the space with anything other than an overshot card. And all an overshot card is just like a little piece of cardboard that's uh, designed to fit right the diameter of the shell. And it basically helps fill that space. And I just okay. I don't want to add a step. And why, why spend $7 on, on pieces of cardboard when you can just buy the right stuff and not have to worry about it? And you can go a lot quicker when you're loading. All right. But that's one of the big things you'll notice is, is getting your recipes right. Now, you'll see wads that look the same. And you might see a bunch that have the same little spiral rib on it, but it, maybe it's four or five millimeters shorter because it's designed to be what you call a field wad. And then you don't realize, you quick, you grab them off. Oh, those are 12 S3s. You go grab them off the shelf, you start loading, you realize, man, I got a lot of space left in there. And basically what that is, you just you bought a field wad and you didn't realize it. And I have a bunch over there that look just like double A's, but you put them up beside of one another, they are shorter than field wads. How would you know? Is that going to be listed on the package then when you go to buy the wads? Yeah, let me see if I, okay. let, me, let me see. I got plenty of, plenty of wads over here. So you'll see right here on on these ones, they'll actually say field wads. And oh, they'll, okay. They'll, they'll tell you they're made <clears throat> for that. But if you go, if I go over here in the light, do you guys see how small that, that section is the little uh the section that's designed to collapse the little uh oh, what the heck you're <laughs> kind of at a loss for words but that that little section has like the little posts and the legs on it right below the cup and the base unfortunately you got too much glare on there i'm oh, not able to there... see. you don't have to open it up yeah. but I, yeah, yeah but w that uh these are shorter they're shorter because they're designed to they're designed to... Okay, there we um, go. So that's a shorter wad, but it's the same ounce and an eighth cup. So you okay. can see how short... You can see how, how see how that's longer? Yeah, By yeah. about a quarter of an inch. And that's because this is designed to have one of those Herco, you know, 28 grain powder charges to, to fill, help fill that space. Okay. So that's so now, one of the big differences. The main thing is not to get, you know, you don't want to get bogged down with, with all the terminology. You can't follow a very simple formula if you just start off going through the handbook. It's yeah, not, absolutely. you know, once you, once you buy the core components that you need, you can follow the instructions and, and you're going to be fine. I mean, and then once you, once you understand it a bit more, then you can start to maybe fine tune the shells and, and the shot yeah, and the powders and stuff and educate yourself a little bit more. So it doesn't have to be like, we don't want anybody to come off the, the podcast tonight and feel like, oh man, this is way too complicated, you know? I, I yeah. think personally, this is a lot easier undertaking than metallic. I, yeah. I really do. I've went over a lot of details, but that's really just to help somebody that's interested. Mm -hmm. It does not need to be that complicated. I mean, mm -hmm. you could, that book that you have is a phenomenal resource. Okay. And I guarantee you can make some darn good looking shells by just following the recipes and kind of taking your time watching a couple YouTube videos to really get you there. You know, it's yeah. when you're getting into that boutique stuff that really starts to get a little, 
overwhelming. And this is, again, this is the Lyman 5th Edition Shot Show Reloading Handbook. I don't have any affiliate links or anything. I just bought this at the Sporting Goods Store. 20 bucks. This one was printed in January of 2019. So it's got some very new information in it. Yeah, so that's a great it, resource. Yeah, this I mean, it's very easy to read. They make it very simple to understand. I guess you yeah. can call Lyman if you have questions, or you can call uh, Mech if you have questions about the press. They got good customer service. Yeah, uh, it's real easy. They tell you, you know, 12S3 wad, Windjammer wad, double A cloner. You know, they're real. They really call out everything you need down to the grains. And and it's and, and then a lot of times you, you guys will notice when you look at your recipes, it'll call out a certain primer and all that stuff. And, and you will hear a lot of guys that maybe don't have as much experience shotgun. They tell you that you have to follow a recipe verbatim or you're going to have problems. That's 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 one of those things that scares people off. And I, I'm just here to tell you it's absolutely not true. I buy whatever primer I can, as long as it's not Magnum. I don't typically use Magnum unless it's a, obviously a Magnum, you know, waterfowl load or something. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, I will use Cheddite, Remington, Federal, Winchester. I don't care what the primer is. If I can get it cheap, and, and, and that's what I'll use, I, I notice very little, because I run my stuff through a chronograph, I, I notice very little difference uh, feet per second at, at all. I mean, the only thing that you will notice, it's a small rabbit hole thing. You actually... We'll notice that some primers are slightly larger in in diameter than others. So ballistics products, if you go on there, they'll tell you the OD of each one of the primers from Cheddite to Rio to Winchester to Federal. And they're actually, believe it or not, some of them vary by a thousandth or two. Okay. Just so you know. Yeah, I got a wide cool. question for you real quick. Um, yeah. Say somebody's reloading defensive loads for a Mossberg shock wave, either in 20 or 12 gauge, and they have the um, cylinder bore on them, right? They don't have, yep. they don't have, they're not ready for close. Nope. Is there yep. a Y that can be used if they wanted to tighten that group up? If they wanted to tighten that up? Yeah, your, your best option for something like that is to go less slits in a wad. So the, the more slits in a wad, they say, the more that it opens up. And that's why a lot of guys will actually buy from somebody like Ballistics Products, and they will. You can actually buy these wads unslit. So if you want to cut two, you want to cut three, you want to cut ten, you know, kind of whatever floats your boat. Some people are really willing to go down that rabbit hole. My my guess would be is if you probably would go and cut say three into something like this, you're probably going to get a pretty darn tight pattern. That'd be kind of fun to try out because you could you could make them up and take them to the range and pattern test them on a board. Absolutely, and see yeah, what they're going to do at like at like three yards or whatever, five yards. Especially if you're yeah. talking about a home defense load, you know. Yeah, you'll you'll probably want to do that too, Travis. You know, with with your loads when you get started, um, you you might find certain certain wads give you better patterns, and mm -hmm. there's different types of shot too. You know, there's a, like a softer shot. So that's one of the other things I actually forgot to mention. I really wish I'd have remembered is in these cheaper shells, like these Federals, these don't come with the Magnum hard shot that the the green, that the Remingtons do, the premium Remingtons. These come with a harder, the more antimony in the shot, and it's a harder pellet, which is better for breaking clays. So okay. it, it's that type of thing, too. So that's what it, a lot of the guys, like I said, they miss them details and they say, well, it, it's it's just not worth reloading. But I, I'm here to tell you, it absolutely is. You're putting premium components in there and you're making them for several bucks a box cheaper. But I guess if you're looking at just the cheapest box of shells and it doesn't look, I guess, quite as impressive on the saving side of things. Yeah. I now, Do you have any experience with the Fiocchi uh, shells at all? Because I showed you the, the stuff that I bought, which is their I, Target Max or whatever it's called. Because, I mean, that I bought 250 with the thought that maybe when I burned through them in the first couple of weeks of the Summer Trap League, I might want to just look at reloading them or getting into it. You know, yeah, that, those are not a, they're not an expensive uh, round, but yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a European haul. Um, probably. So you could find data for them. I know ballistics products would have it on their website and they'll have good information for you. Um, I don't think that's in your Lyman book. I think the Lyman only covers the American yeah. variants, unfortunately, but okay. I would guess if you if you shoot one of them empty it send me a picture and i'll tell you i i'd be willing yeah. to bet you it's probably a straight wall haul just like the fed will be my guess here's what they say on the website i'm looking at the shields website right now so the guys the ammo that i bought for my summer trap league just to try it initially it's a uh 
Fioki target max, 1,200 feet per second, two and three quarter inch shell, seven and a half or eight shot, one of the two, one ounce, or is it one and an eighth ounce, one of the two. It says that uh, target max uses quality reloadable holes with primer and powder combinations to ensure cleaner burning. One piece wads have the softness to ensure perfect gas sealing and a pre cut order to ensure the best patterns. Um, let's see, I don't know, they don't necessarily tell us much about the actual construction of it, but it's an, it's an orange plastic, but I think that's just the. Yeah, why the color you, that they use. Yeah, when you yeah. shoot one of them, send me a picture of the inside. Yeah. And and the other thing is too, it starts to, it, it really helps sometimes too. Like you take your caliper and you measure the inside, like okay. measure the depth. Like take it, you know, drop your 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 depth gauge portion of your caliper into here, and then that'll kind of mm. tell you how much space you have. And well, maybe I can cut, just to I can also cut one down the side too. You know, yeah, yeah. Did you use just how'd you cut that? Just like a little hacksaw, or what'd you do to cut through that? Uh, uh, with the plastic, I just started with like an exacto knife, and then when I got oh to yeah, the steel, I shoved like it. A Dremel or something. And, yeah, okay. I just hacked it with a little cut off. Okay. Little. Oh, maybe I can find a cutaway of the shell on the Fioki website, or I can get some more info because I bought a lot of them. It'd be nice to be able to reload those, and if not, then I'll just have to step up my game and buy more premium ammo especially i got a feeling i'm gonna really enjoy it especially after going to the the range today and going by the trap stations thinking oh my god i want to get started with this yeah, you know I, yeah no it's a blast it's okay absolute, it's a blast cool man all right well we're gonna go ahead and stop at this point so uh john avid waterfowler i want to thank you for joining us today we got a lot of information out there for people and again it's not always about saving money we tried to cover this at the very beginning and so you know I, like i said i'm ready for an onslaught of people leaving comments on the video saying well it's so much cheaper to buy at the store it's not it's not about saving money it's about making a more premium shell for less money right um, um we do got one more uh, yeah. question yeah go ahead man he wanted to know uh Differences between five point and eight point crimps. Oh, okay. So okay. six point, six point and eight point. So five so and eight, I think. Five and eight. Yeah, five point, eight point. point, eight point. I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a a five, but I I do have a six right here. So so there's a six. Okay, and these are real common in more of a Magnum load and European load. Now this happens to be a Browning. Which is basically just a double A and and a steel steel base. Um, everything else I have here is eights. Mm. Now, when I make my steel loads, you'll notice, especially in real big shots like steel and buckshot, you'll notice that these are typically sixes. So the number yes. of pedals are basically the the crimp is what you're looking yep. at. Six yep. pedals, six crimps yep. essentially. So okay. yeah, that's exactly what it is. And then right. you know. Uh, like I said, and then I know maybe oh. some of the guys didn't get to see us. So that's that uh, sealer. So you guys that are maybe duck hunters or, or maybe you're out in the elements hunting or whatever, this is uh, the seal your, seal your crimp. And that's kind of – that's what it looks like when you put it on there. So you apply it after you after you seal yep. the crimp, then you yep. apply it on it's just as a water sealant. And that's, yeah, okay. I, set, okay. I set them all on the base, and I just put the sealant on. And, and then here's – Here's one other thing I think that's kind of oh yeah this is a this is a neat thing and I'll just quick show you guys how how it works but I mean this is kind of the, the backwards way of doing it but yeah, that's all right when you when you're loading drop your shells in there and it sits and then I think those are in about seventeen dollars on Amazon when I was looking them up today yeah yeah and then all you do is you just you know it, it just it makes it quicker to to fill your box okay and these are like good little like old gun shop or or gun show finds and you just um tip it upside down and you you can load a whole box oh, wow. real easy instead of just loading each one i think i paid like six bucks or something at a at hey, a cool. gun shop yeah. all right um alaskan do you have a, a question for us here before we go yeah, real quick before we go, I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. that um, sealant he was talking about because I mm -hmm. I have issues with some slugs. So, like, this is a Brennicky, just regular classic Magnum. Yeah. And so, would you put the sealant like on the inside, right in there? And is that where you were talking about putting the sealant earlier? Or? Yeah. See, now that doesn't see. I was kind of thinking maybe that would have like a clear overshot card in it. You could actually see it. it looks like they just roll crimped right over and that's actually what's holding the slug in place mm -hmm. so now hold that shell to the side pull back a little do bit you, yeah do you see there should be like right near the bottom of the slug 
and then the uh, metal base there should be like it should be like a little plastic ba- what they'd call it as a base wad and that should be what seals your your powder and in in the in the hull yeah, this one looks cork really okay yeah it could be cork oh, okay so it, there so, is already some waterproofing in it then or some, yeah, some waterproofing may, in they, it not they, waterproofing necessarily yeah Brennicky is a pretty pretty good brand i would think that they would take some sort of measure that's probably a little bit more extreme than somebody like you know like a chief of remington box or something that's four or five dollars right. well like i said caribou hunting when me and buddy flipped a kayak um not going to go on that story it's long and huge but uh, <laughs> it, uh you know every brand of shotgun shells that my buddy who was packing the meat and there's grizzly bears everywhere you yeah know? Uh, i've actually killed a grizzly bear in there and the place where i hunt and camp there's been like grizzly bear tracks on the sandbars right oh boy and um like you know having a shell that if it gets wet is no good and the brennicky black magic magnum which is this is not a black magic magnum yep. this is what I grab quickly uh the d duplex steel the um uh federal classic magnums all of them were not waterproof and i was just like what's you know, the best way to waterproof? maybe that's where a sabbat slug may come into slightly better play because it has a a, basically, it's like a plastic, it's a sabo over it. Now, what I was going to mm-hmm. say, maybe about those slugs you have there, I wonder if you can run a seam of sealant around the... Like inside, with a Q-tip the, or something, you know? Yeah, like the outside edge. And I, I don't think that would cause... Yeah, like right around right around the edge, right in between, like the edge of the shell. So, that, yep. Like, okay. what if you did it on the inside, right on the lead, and get that sealant on the lead and get that sealant on the plastic... I don't think that would cause you any pressure. I don't think that would do anything for pressure. The sealant's pretty, pretty thin. Right. Pretty okay. thin. It stinks awful, but it, it, it should work. I would think that might work. And what if there's you, somebody else that knows more about slugs than me? Do you do? Would you do primers as well? Or I've even heard people doing the space between the plastic and the the brass. There. I mean. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've heard of guys doing stuff like that. I know primer sealant's a real big one, but like I said, after dropping a. A uh, cheap couple Winchester experts in the water, and then a week later, somebody pulling them out and firing them, kind of sold me that they're pretty waterproof as is at, the, at that point. I actually so had I a cheap of, Winchester go bad on me. We were hiking back to a lake to duck hunt on the lake, and um, a grouse flew up on the trail, and I turned around and it went click, and I had a browning shell underneath it because I had my shells mixed for whatever reason, pumped it and shot the grouse. But um, yeah, I. Uh, I haven't used much much Winchester stuff. I've been kind of sticking with Federal. I just actually started using these duplex Winchester loads recently this this year, and I I, I really kind of like the duplex style, so I started making my own. Cool. Thank you. You got All it. All right. Uh, so let's see. I think we're going to go ahead and call it here, guys. Uh, that's pretty much it. Tacos and French fries said, great show, very informative. Well, hey, man, this was this was all John and a lot of great questions coming in. So, uh, guys, I think we're going to go ahead and call us. We had some people that were joining in tonight. We had AWAG that was here earlier. We had Storm and Norman Gunworks that was with us. Nice Strike, unfortunately, was not able to join in, but I talked about his situation. So, real quick, we're going to let you guys get your plugs in, and I want you all to head over to the Guns and Geeks podcast with Never Enough Ammo tonight. So, uh, Alaska Ballistics, we'll start off with you, man. Uh, any final plugs you want to get in for your channel before we call it? Um. I just have a video every Wednesday, a 460 rolling vi- video coming up this week, and uh, I've got a live chat tonight at 7 uh, Alaskan time, so 11 seven, Eastern eight, time. 9, 10, 11, yeah, 10 uh, o'clock yeah. Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah. So I got that going on, and then I'm trying to put out as much 2A stuff as we can right now, so uh, our, our mayor Cabe- uh, closed Cabela, so I've got a... Um, a video up about that uh, protest, which is illegal under Alaska state law. And, you know, it's a first and second amendment violation, obviously. Oh, wow. So, okay. um, yeah. So, uh, I got a, uh, protest or a petition up. I get out that for people to sign if they don't mind. Um, yeah. but uh, again, thank you for letting me come on. And John, it's uh great to meet you on here. And, uh, it was thanks nice for all to meet the, you guys. Thanks for all the advice, man. So, Good stuff. Now, now I'm like I'm like ready to go buy my press. Oh man, I gotta I still gotta get set up for my my brass press. I gotta get going on that here too. Now that we're at the new place, I got a workbench I gotta put together and I can get that going and maybe start rolling my own this summer. So 
Yeah, All right. Shotgun, yeah, shotgun loading seems more interesting to me than what uh, yeah, like, it is. Not that it would be lazy, but it seems a little bit easier. I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's a great time, great way to get started in reloading, in my opinion. Yeah, it, yeah. It's not quite as complicated. I mean, honestly, brass isn't that bad. I guess it just depends how far you're going down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, and uh, Rich White, any final plugs you want to give us before you go? Any final wads you want to give us before you go? <laughs> uh, just check out uh, This Week Unloaded every Sunday over on the Unloaded Media channel between, with start time again between 8 and 9 p.m. Eastern. And you never know what we're going to talk about or even have fights about. I mean, if we were in the same room, probably, somebody probably would have got popped in the nose last night. <laughs> it was an epic an epic argumentative discussion and bracket over Easter candy. I mean, it was, man, it was, there was cursing and hurt feelings and people <laughs> ducking out left and right. And I mean, the question is, what would Jesus have done? Well, Jesus would have chosen the same one as me. So if you guys want to know what won that, what won that uh, bracket, make sure you watch the episode. So yeah. yeah. It, it, it was brutal last night. It, mm-hmm. it really was. I mean, it started out, we were all friends and talking about stuff. I don't forget. What were we talking about? Once we got that, to the chocolate. Chocolate bunny versus the chocolate covered marshmallow was gloves off, man. It was just a, it was a blood sport. It was a cage match after that was stepping in the octagon. We had the Twix versus the caramel egg versus the Cadbury egg. I'm serious. You never hear, you'll never hear grown people yell more at each other over candy than we did last night. The upset of the night was the Cadbury cream egg losing in the first round. I mean, Oh, that was that was just the controversy right there. I mean, that's just a staple of Easter candy. You know, whether you like them or not, you feel obligated to eat them, and yet it did make it past the first round. So, I don't even uh, remember what beat it at this right now. <laughs> uh, it might have been like the malted milk balls or something. I I think a lot of people didn't like the consistency of the Cadbury no. cream egg. They said they're it just was, nasty. Oh it was just the milk balls, I don't know. I got to go back and look at the bracket now, but it was it was pretty hardcore. So you guys need to check out uh, this weekend loaded. Check out that podcast and listen to last night's episode. It was just called Happy. Easter, I think, was not a happy Easter when we got done. In fact, Calaveras, I haven't even apologized to him yet for uh, you know for getting personal with him on the podcast last night. He was getting the family involved in it and stuff, man. It was like oh, yeah, rivalries being formed out of this one. You know, there's Bloods versus Crips, there's Reese's versus Cadbury. Yeah, so, so you know, shows so over emails Travis and I both about how we were wrong about the that the Reese's. Should have won. <laughs> and, you know, Calaveras, being an engineer, you think you would understand the design perfection that is the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. You don't mess with the formula. It's fine as is, you know. Anyway, that's a, you guys go watch that episode. It was very exciting. Rich, can you pop that link in one more time before we go here tonight? Um, I don't know if go I over there and find it again. and or Go back in your chat and you can copy and paste it, I think, if you, yeah, if you find it. it. All right, and uh, Avid Waterfowl, Waterfowler, a.k.a. John, thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate it. You're welcome to come back anytime. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I next week we'll time. talk rifle ammo. If, if that works well, we'll get Squib on here, and uh, and we'll just start talking. You know, Because, again, reloading, it's – it's. I'm just saying, as a YouTube content creator, the few reloading videos I've actually done have just skyrocketed in views, and there's a lot of first-timers that are watching these videos. There's going to be a lot of questions that are popping up in the videos, you know, as – as members of, of, of kind of the, the gun culture, the two-way culture, let's make these people feel welcome and bring them into the community. Uh, you know, the only the only dumb question is to not ask the question that you don't, you know, that, that you have that you don't ask. So, um, but anyway, yeah, looking at all the questions coming in, the, the, there's, there's a lot of reloaders getting into it right now. And obviously, looking at the lack of reloading supplies on the shelves right now, too, at this moment, uh, you can see that it's definitely, definitely taken off. So, John, I'll leave some uh, final words with you before we give a shout out to people that were watching this evening. Yeah, you know, I, I guess one of the things I, I, I'd like to say, I, I'm not a real big, I don't have a huge channel. You know, I've got like three videos. I, I, I'm i more so watching you guys. You know, that's that's uh, that's what I do. I mean, it really helps me pass time on my long commutes to work. But cool. uh, one of the things I did say is I did like a little uh, just, you know, off the cuff half hour, uh, you know, video driving to work the one morning because I was getting so many questions about it when I was shooting at my local range. And a lot of people that I've noticed between going to the gun shops, going to the range, a lot of these guys are just saying, well, I'll make my own. And they're kind of like doing it out of fear. And I don't know if that's really the way I'd get into it. But if you have interest in it, I wouldn't sweat getting into it right now. I just wouldn't put yourself under a lot of pressure, like trying to get the components, trying to get the, you know, know, basically trying to have a completed round in a week. Like I I would not put that pressure on myself. I would go with the route you were saying where you just – you know what? Dabble in it for now. And you know what? When those primers pop up, buy them. Powder pops up, get it. Because right now, if you can't find the stuff, 
I, I would say plan more so plan on becoming a reloader because mm-hmm. at this point it may be really tough to become one overnight because at this point I can't find anything and the stuff I find I don't think you guys should pay the price because I, I think it's price gouged. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I mean that's and that's just it. People getting into right now that want everything at this very moment they're going to pay a premium yeah. and they might realize. It's, Wait a minute, yeah. that press was a hundred dollars less. Yeah. Why is it a hundred dollars less now than it was back in the spring? Because you're paying this. Just check the Amazon prices on stuff. Up, a little price meter and stuff is just jumping up right now because Absolutely. of the demand. So Absolutely. you know, get 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 a get a reloading handbook or just get into some forums online. Watch a lot of videos on it. Watch Absolutely. the videos that these companies make. Mac and Lyman have videos. Um, you know, Lee. These companies have videos you can watch on YouTube. These are from the companies themselves, and they'll show you how the equipment operates, like how to use the caliper, how to use the scale, how to use the press. So educate yourself on these things, and then you'll find yourself more comfortable with it when the time comes for you to actually get hands on with it. So just keep that in mind. We want to emphasize safety the whole time. Yeah. We don't want anybody to feel like they just got to go buy a press tomorrow no. and just figure it all out. That's not what this is about. This is kind of, this is the marathon, right? This is not a sprint for those of you that are shooters. So keep that in mind. Right. Yeah. I mean, it'll come quicker, you know, with time. I mean, it's right now, I think it's a great time to get into it. Do your research. Like you said, because mm-hmm. there really is no pressure. If you can't find the stuff, this is your time to kind of read up on it, study yep. it. Yep. And by the time you are ready to make your first round, you're like, you're kind of an expert from the research. You just haven't done it, you know, manually yet. And, you know, it'll come a lot easier when you do after you've done that. research. I'll tell you right now, you feel a lot more comfortable after you've done that. Mm-hmm. You've uh, done the research, too. Well, and, sure. you know, just show it, having you take us through the process of how you put these shells together. And that right there just automatically, is, you know, oh, OK, I understand that. You can go back and watch that portion of the video again. And I get it now. I understand how this stuff works. Then it's just up to you now to figure out how to make it work for you, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, the hardest part of that is just dialing in that final crimp. And really, what I always cool. tell people is to kind of start out of control where your crimp's not deep enough and then work your way down until you're satisfied, lock the nut in place, and start running shells. Yep. Right on, man. Right on. All right. So it's been a great discussion tonight. We covered a lot of ground in 90, 90 minutes. Guys, make sure you share this podcast with your friends and family. Go back and watch it and listen to it again. Uh, if you get a chance to, let's see, it says, I watch more YouTube 2 related stuff than TV. Review says, yeah, there's a lot of videos coming on that now, especially when there's state laws and ordinances and all kinds of other stuff being thrown down the pipe and gun stores being closed and opened. And there's just a lot of information out there. So all right, so let's see who's who's joining us this evening over on the YouTube side. We had a big crowd this evening. We got Rich White, Calvers 32 Special, Reviews out there, Kingpin, Thomas Rees is out there too, Yoder Texas in the house, Tacos and French Fries, uh, New York Outcast, The Juice, very, very active this evening. Guy that comments is out there, C4 Defense is out there too. Make sure you guys check out his channel. He's got a premiere that's coming up for a bull carrier group. He says that Cam Tactical's gonna send him a christmas card this year oh you don't think cam tactical is going to send you a christmas card this year oh don't worry about it you can always move on to a different company oh i dump me and i'm fine with that so guy that comments is out there too uh m gabriel and i did see ss pond earlier jumpy killer in the house poor conservative ecota 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 is out there too uh midnight range tm john z weston probst I oh, hope I didn't miss anybody. Fluffy 10 millimeter Jeep guys in the house. Scott P79. And let's see. Kevin Jones. Alaskan, Alaskan Ballistics was out there and over here. Mystic Guns in the house. Whew, lots of people tonight. All right. We're going to go ahead and call it at that. Oh, I see Ghost Tactical is out there too. Hello, Ghost. Hello, Ghost. And so that's it, guys. This is Caliber Corner episode number 131, where we talked about the basics of reloading shot shells. Again, be very careful. Take your time with it. Don't rush into it. And uh, I think that's pretty much about it. So maybe next week we'll get Night Strike back on here. Make sure you guys check out the Guns and Geeks podcast. Make sure you check out the Get Off My Lawn podcast over on the Sand Hill Shooter channel. Lots of podcasts out there for you guys. So with that being said, uh, this has been episode number 131, and we are done. All right. Adios, Feliz.